Episode 265 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you in part by the Boss Free Virtual Summit happening right now at BossFreeSummit.com. Get an MBA in the business school of starting your own business and being your own boss in eight days for free. Again, visit BossFreeSummit.com. Remember this for the rest of your life. To the fourth grader, the fifth grader is a genius. You only need to be a few steps ahead of where your customers are in order to be able to serve them. Hi, and welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. It's the show dedicated to your personal and your professional growth. I'm Jeff, and I believe that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then intentional and consistent reading is an absolute must. The Read to Lead podcast is going to help you narrow this important reading list and bring you key insights and valuable ideas from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. Today, we're joined by Ryan Levesque. His new book is called Choose, the Single Most Important Decision Before Starting Your Business. I'll be asking Ryan to share his advice for you if you struggle with fear and doubt about starting your own thing, the single biggest mistake people make when starting their business, why you want most of your ideas to fail in the beginning, and much, much more. Now, if this topic is indeed right up your alley, I can't think of anything more appropriate for you to be thinking about this week than attending my online conference that starts the same day this episode is being released. It's called the Boss Free Virtual Summit. Ryan, in fact, is one of our speakers. So if you don't get enough of him today, you can get more of him at the Boss Free Summit. It's free to register and you can find out more and sign up right now at Boss Free Summit. There are four to five speaker sessions each day, and each day's sessions is available for viewing for 72 hours. That way you can watch at your convenience. But if that's still not enough time, you might want to check out the all access pass option. We call it the Boss Free VIP. Find out more about that option when you register. It comes with on-demand access to all the speaker sessions for life, $1,500 in bonuses from speakers, and a special invitation to our private boss-free community. Again, to get all the details, just go to bossfreesummit.com right now. Ryan Levesque is the Inc. 500 CEO of the Ask Method Company and the number one national best-selling author of Ask, a book featured here on the show a few years ago. More on that in a moment which was named by Inc. as the number one marketing book of the year. Ryan's book has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Forbes, and Entrepreneur. And over 250,000 entrepreneurs subscribe to his email newsletter offering business advice. Ryan is also a co-founder and investor in Bucket.io, a leading marketing funnel software for entrepreneurs. And Ryan's brand new book is called Choose, the Single Most Important Decision Before Starting Your Business. Well, Ryan, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm excited to have you back after all this time. Hard to believe it's been four, well, nearly four years. Welcome back officially to the Read to Lead podcast. Jeff, it is so good to be back. I'm so grateful for the opportunity and excited to be chatting with you. Well, one of the things that, that caught my attention right away when I first began reading your brand new book was you say it's a sequel or rather, I'm sorry, a prequel to uh, the book we talked about four years ago. Why do you view Choose as a prequel to Ask? It's a prequel for a few reasons. So obviously in the um, sequence of writing the book, it came after Ask. Um, But when I wrote Ask, the intent of the book was to share with people the methodology my team and I had used to enter 23 different markets, Uh, markets ranging from things like Scrabble tile jewelry to Hmm. orchid care to memory improvement and all sorts of obscure niche markets in which we had a lot of success. And the premise of the book is by asking the right questions in the right way, you can understand your audience at a deep emotional level and through that deep research, communicate to them in a way that resonates at at, at their core. And um, the book was wildly successful. Hmm. Um, A lot of people have had success with the book. And yet I still had letters and emails and messages from people who said, Ryan, I read the book, but I didn't have success. It didn't work for me. What am I doing wrong? Mm. And what I realized, Jeff, was that in the process of teaching the ask method 
and the success that we had in all these different markets, what I didn't reveal, what I didn't teach was how we chose those markets in the first place. And there's an entire process, a methodology to that. And so it sort of kicked off what became a three-year research project to really uncover what was it that separated our most successful markets from the ones that never really took off. I did the same research with our clients, with our students, and looked at what was it that separated the markets and businesses that really took off and those that either failed or that never really made it big. And what we found, Jeff, was that there were seven factors, seven factors that uh, separated the successful markets from the failing markets. And the reason why choose is a prequel to ask is before you can ask people the right questions, you've got to choose who you're going to ask. <laughs> you got to choose your market, the business you're going to start. And so um, even though it comes after ask, it's really the book you should read first. So is it safe to say then, if I'm understanding what you're saying, the people having success with Ask had already done that hard part and maybe were running successful businesses and Ask helped grow that even bigger. And then the people struggling were people who were just starting out oftentimes? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a few things. There's a, there's a metaphor I use in the book that I think is really helpful to kind of put this together. And it's, and it's like this. I say, mm. you know, starting a business is like tossing your raft in the river. Mm. And, you know, the river is the, the, the path that's going to get you to your end goal, your end destination, just like in a business, right? We all start a business for different reasons. Uh, some of us do it for, you know, for freedom, for, for impact, for legacy or a combination of all the above, but we all have our reasons for starting our business. And just like uh, starting a business, tossing your boat in the river, you know, we expect that that river is going to take us to where we want to go. And what I found is that there's so many people who had spent um, all their time focusing on um, picking out the perfect raft, um, hiring the absolute best crew, um, rowing that raft, rowing that boat 18 hours a day. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you toss your raft in the river pointed in the wrong direction, or worse yet, mm -hmm. you toss your raft in a river that doesn't have any water in it or too much water that swallows you up whole, you're never going to get to that destination. And so the people who had success for whatever reason had chosen rivers that were good rivers for them. But more often than not, I saw people choosing rivers that were never going to get them to their destination. And so I thought, what if I could teach people how to find that hidden river, the river that's just the right amount of current, that's headed in the right direction, that's going to take you to exactly where you want to go. And so the people who had success with Ask for one reason or another, had chosen rivers that were uh, good good rivers for them. Mm -hmm. And the people who failed, by and large, the single biggest reason came down to one thing. They had chosen a bad market. They had chosen a bad river, a river that no matter how hard they rode was never going to take mm -hmm. them to where they want to go. Well, I want to dig in more in just a bit to that sort of Goldilocks problem of of too big, too small, and, and just right. But before we do that, I know that uh, one of the biggest worries that many of us face when launching a new business is is losing the the, the consistent, the stable, uh, good nature of the life that we already have, the steady job and mm. paycheck. And that was certainly the case for me when I had thoughts of making the jump uh, six, seven years ago. What advice, Ryan, would you give to somebody struggling with that worry? You know, it's something that I see a lot, right? It's a, it's a question that I raise in the book. People often wonder, do you have to give up good in order to go for great? Mm. In other words, most people that I work with, most of my readers, most people who I encounter, their life is is fine. It's not like they're living in a cardboard box on the side of the road, uh, <laughs> homeless with no food. Like they're not in that situation. Their f life is fine, right? They've mm -hmm. got a good middle class life and sometimes upper middle class life. They've, you know, they they have a home. You know, they're saving a little bit of money. They they've got a decent job. All of these things. But like I felt before I started my first business, mm -hmm. it felt like there was more. Like it felt like I I had more to give. I felt like you know I was destined to do more in my life. And I think a lot of people. They, they feel that way, right? They, you know, I had this moment where I said, if I'm, if I'm going to do something more with my life, if not now, when, mm. right? Like if not now, when, like, what am I waiting for? Right. Am I waiting for some milestone or whatever? And, <laughs> and I think a lot of us feel that way where it's like, you know, we see people um, doing things and maybe it's people we grew up with. Maybe it's people we follow online and, and there's something that sort of clicks for us. We say, okay, now's the moment, but then fear comes in. Right. And, and, and all these thoughts, I remember the thoughts flooding my mind when I was at this place where I was, you know, what if we run out of money? Mm -hmm. um, what if I can't pay my mortgage? What if, you know, what am I going to do? Like, what if, what's going to happen? What if I can't provide, you know, nowadays, what if I can't provide for my kids? What am I going to do? Um, I think a lot of us feel that way. And that fear I see holds a lot of people back. Mm -hmm. And for me, what's interesting is, is I'm a very risk 
averse entrepreneur. Mm. The reason why I obsessed over what became the ask method is because I wanted to ensure that before I started anything, it was going to succeed. Mm. And choose takes that one step further. Before I even decide what business I want to go into, I want to make sure that I'm choosing a market, I'm choosing a business that is set up for success. And if I just, I'm willing to put the work in. And that's what I, I know a lot of, and I imagine your listeners are like this as well. I'm willing to put the work in. And I talk to a lot of people like that who say, if I, I'm willing to do the work, I just don't want to put myself into something where I do the work, I row those 18 hours a day, and I find out that I'm never going to get to where I want to go. And so um, that is a fear that I think holds a lot of people back. And um, if, if you're that type of person, I think you'll really resonate with the, not only the message in the book, but also the methodology in the book, which is all about preserving that good life. So you don't have to go bankrupt. You don't have to, you know, um, have your rags to riches. You know, I, I lost it all. I was living in a cardboard box, but then everything turned around. No, there's a way that you can keep that good life that you've built um, without having to lose it all. Well, you're speaking my language for sure. I'm definitely a risk averse entrepreneur. And I think that's <laughs> one of the reasons why both of your books have, have resonated with me so much. I certainly used to be the kind of person when working a regular job, I could never imagine myself being comfortable with working for myself. And now having done it for nearly six years, I can't imagine going back. And so yeah. <laughs> it's nice to be on the other side. Well, uh, why when going through the process of deciding which market to focus on, do you say you actually want most of your ideas to fail and, and not pass these these tests? You know, I think a, a big challenge that um, a lot of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs and people who want to start their business um, want to be their own boss, want to do their own thing, run mm -hmm. into, and I can certainly say that I fall into this category, is um, the, the struggle with the paradox of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think a lot of people say, all right, um, I want to I want to be my own boss. I want to do my own thing and I want to do it because I want more freedom. I don't want to I don't want to be tied to a, a nine to five job or I don't want to uh, be hold be beholden to somebody else. If I want to make more money where I have to you know, beg mm. on my knees for a <laughs> raise, um, I, I don't want to I want to be able to travel more. I want to be able to make my own hours. I want to I want to have, you know, financial freedom and I want to make more of an impact. You know, there are people's lives that I want to change that I want to change the world in this small way. And I and I maybe want to leave something for my family. Right. This legacy idea. I want to have something that I can leave uh, for my family, for my kids, for my loved ones, um, when um, you know when my time has passed, like all of these things, and in that in that quest, mm. there's so many options, <laughs> so many options, right? What do you what do you do? Do you do you set up a brick and mortar you know business? Do you start a restaurant? Do you sell physical products online? Do you sell on Amazon? Do you do drop shipping? Do you you know all of these different possibilities? You start right. a podcast. Do you <laughs> you know start a Facebook group? Like these million possibilities, and I think a lot of people get stuck in overwhelm. And so one of the things that I take people through in the book is this journey of introspection. So there's this introspective piece of this, which is identifying what's the right business for you, as well as this external piece, which is identifying what market shows the most promise, what business mm. is not only going to fuel your soul, but also fill your bank account. And what I found in this process is that there, there are four different types of entrepreneurs. Um, that are driven by different motivations, different um, internal motivations. And each entrepreneurial type, as I describe it, has a different mix of the light side and shadow side. And I'll, and I'll talk about them each briefly. So first type of entrepreneur is what I call the mission driven or mission based entrepreneur. Now, mission driven or mission based entrepreneurs are driven by a desire. They've got a, a cause uh, that they would die on a hill for. Mm. And what I mean by that is there's some wrong in the world that is driving them to want to make a change. In the book, I talk about Christy Kennedy's story of how uh, her son, who's autistic, um, was bullied as a young kid. And it drove her to want to make a difference in his school, which led her to build this program that's now served tens of thousands of schools around the country to eliminate bullying 
from their uh, school you know, campus. And she works with teachers, administrators, politicians to get this in as many schools as possible. But it all started because she had this mission that she wanted to eliminate bullying from her child's school, which then uh, exploded into this uh, nationwide mission. So um, mission-based entrepreneurs. Second type are passion-driven or passion-based entrepreneurs. Now, their drive is a little different. Mission-based people want to eliminate some wrong in the world. They want to move people away from something negative. Passion-based entrepreneurs want to move people towards something that they love, that, that that's something positive in the world. So oftentimes they have something like music or painting or gardening or something that they love that they want to transform into their vocation. Um, I tell the story of Charlie Wallace in the book, who is a traveling musician who decided to start teaching guitar lessons online, who exploded that into a series of, of, of guitar trainings, a membership. And when he first approached the ask method, he was making a few thousand dollars a month in his business. Fast forward a few years later today, he has a $2.5 million a year business mm -hmm. teaching guitar lessons online to thousands of aspiring guitar players around the world. And it all started with his passion for guitar. Now, not everybody has a mission or passion. There's a third type of entrepreneur, which I describe as the uh, opportunity based entrepreneur, opportunity driven entrepreneur. And, and, and this is the type of entrepreneur that I would say is, is the entrepreneur in the most classic sense of the world. Mm -hmm. Opportunity based entrepreneurs are the type of person who they look around and they say, why is it that nobody has solved this problem before? Like, how is it that, you know, that this still exists? And they spot opportunities and pursue those opportunities. And so I, I share the story of Dana Olbermann. She and her husband built this uh, company called Sleep Sense where they help parents with newborn children, newborn babies, help their kids sleep through the night. And it wasn't a mission of theirs. It wasn't a passion of theirs. You know, they had young kids and they couldn't get their kids to sleep <laughs> through the night. And they looked around and they said, how is it that there's like no information on getting your kiddos to sleep through the night. So they dove into the medical research. Um, they, they, they tested a lot of different things. They found what worked. They had a friend of theirs who was in the same situation. And they said, well, well, why don't you try this? And the friend for the first time ever was able to get their kiddo to sleep through the night. And that led to another friend saying, oh, you gotta talk to Dana. She's the sleep <laughs> expert. Before you knew it, she's been on Good Morning America. She's been on the Today Show. They've helped over 100,000 couples through their paid programs mm -hmm. get their kids to sleep through the night. Um, and now she's one of the foremost experts in the world on this thing. And it all started based on an opportunity that, that she spotted. So that's the third type. But there's one more type. And what's interesting is this is the type that I fell into when I first mm. started my business. And that is the undecided entrepreneur. And the undecided entrepreneur is someone who, you know, you know, you want to start your own business. You know, you want to be your own boss for all the reasons that we've talked about. But you're looking around and you're saying, I just don't know what what to do. I'm undecided. I can't figure things out. And I remember when I first started my first business, the conversations I had with my wife at the dinner table, <laughs> Hey honey, should we do this? Or, Hey, should we do this? And there was like, you know, at some point I think she said, you just got to pick a thing and go with it, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, for that type of, if you're in that situation, um, I recommend actually starting with what I call a practice business. Mm. Now a practice business kind of serves the role that uh, if you think back to when you first learned how to drive a car, Right. Mm -hmm. Think back to your first car. And by the way, most of us can remember the first car we drove. Right. Yes, um, yes. I'm just curious. Do you remember, Jeff, the first car you drove? Us? Yes. Um, my my dad regretted this later, but he got I, I was 16 at the time. He got for me a, a 1966 Mustang. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great first car. I think a lot of your listeners are going to say, man, I'd love to have that car. Uh, I always love playing this game when I, when I um, have conversations with mm. people in groups and I'll have like, you know, if we were interacting right now, if you're, li if you're listening right now, like what was your first car? I'm, I'm actually really curious. Mm. So mine was a, a rusted out, uh, 1987 Jeep, uh, Cherokee, uh, mm. standard transmission. I learned how to drive stick in the <laughs> mountains of New Hampshire oh in the middle of the winter. So, uh, it was a fun experience, but the, the point is maybe for you, what I'm about to say is not true, but that was not mm. my dream car. That was not <laughs> the car that I said, you know, if I could, you know, um, you know, when I, for the next 25 years, if I could do nothing but drive this car, like <laughs> I'll be a happy man. No, I had posters of my dream car, but it wasn't the first car I learned how to drive. I learned how to, mm. you know, I learned how to, uh, you know, drive stick. I learned how to drive through the snow. I learned, you know, how to turn my wipers on and how to signal and, you know, how to parallel park, but it wasn't in my dream car. And so mm. I think many of us have this false sense when we start a business that the first thing we start is gonna be our forever thing. Mm. And I think it holds a lot of us back, certainly held me back. And so when I alleviated the, the need to find that thing that was gonna be my dream business for the next 
25, 30 years, and instead said, you know what, I'm just gonna start with a practice business. I'm gonna learn how to set up a website. I'm gonna learn how to write an email series. I'm gonna learn how to set up a, a Facebook post. All the things you need to learn when it comes to building an online business. You know, what was funny was immediately, I began focusing on the process instead of the outcome, instead of the results, and that's when the results came. And that business ended up going from nothing to $25,000 a month in 18 months and grew to over half a million dollars a year. Simple little practice business. Mm. So, you know, whichever of these four types you are, and I'd encourage you to really reflect on which of those types resonates with you most. And um, for some people, it may be a combination. It may be, I'm a little bit of this, I'm a little bit of that. And I'm curious, Jeff, um, mm. and I think listeners would be curious, uh, of those four types, is there one that resonates more than the others with you, or is it a combination for you? Personally, yeah, probably undecided, and, and and I very much identified with what you talked about. Uh, you know, thinking we have to have a forever business, and I don't know if this was intuitive for me or not when I first ventured on out on my own six years ago. What I started doing was something I knew when I started doing it, I wasn't going to be doing for a long time, but it was a side hustle I'd been working, and so when I made the transition, I needed something to keep me afloat. And, and, and that side business was it. And then I figured out the rest later. But that side business, that temporary thing gave me time to do that. I mentioned that there's a light and shadow side to every type. And I want to touch on that briefly because I think it's, a, it's, it's in, important. And it starts with this self-discovery, self-awareness, right? Once you know what your blind spots are, you can be aware of them and um, where that can lead you. So for the mission-based entrepreneur, the shadow side is that mission-based entrepreneurs get so tied to their mission in many cases, they tend to struggle with charging money for what it is that they do. Mm. They're so drawn to wanting to change the world. They want to, um, they're, in many cases, they're healers. They're, um, they have a mission, whether it's uh, eliminating bullying or, or um, uh, providing clean drinking water to everyone in the world. They're so drawn to that mission that the struggle is actually charging money for that thing. Mm. The passion-based uh, entrepreneur, the shadow side there is to be careful of, is that passion, that thing that you love, playing guitar, caring for your orchids, uh, watercolor painting, whatever that, that is, um, you can lose passion for that thing when it becomes your voc vocation. Mm -hmm. That thing that you love doing suddenly becomes a J-O-B, a job, <laughs> and it's no longer your passion. So you gotta mm -hmm. be careful that the thing that you love, you become dispassionate for that thing. Uh, the opportunity-based entrepreneur, the challenge there, the risk there, is that you can feel hollow. You're pursuing this mm -hmm. opportunity, but it can be just a thing that makes money but mm. doesn't fuel your soul. So you need to be careful of that. And the undecided entrepreneur, we've really touched on this already, um, you gotta be careful about that analysis paralysis, overthinking it, constantly staying in that safe haven mm. of, well, someday I'd love to do this business, but not ever putting the pedal to the metal and actually getting, you know, making progress in that thing, staying in that undecided mode. So, you know, being aware introspectively of where you are right now can help guide you to what business is going to, um, as I mentioned earlier, not only fuel your soul, but feed your bank account as well. And I, get, I realized as you were answering that, that I answered your question thinking of where I was six years ago when I started today. I'm, I'm in the passion category, which you probably suspected. There, there's a, a major assumption in the book, and I'd like for you to talk about that. And, 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 and that is that uh, the focus is on a business selling education and expertise. Yes. Why did you choose to make that the focus of, no pun intended, why did you choose to make that the focus of choose? <laughs> the, the, the possibilities on the landscape, this mm. paradox of choice, the million things that you could start. I remember where I was when I first got started. And uh, the story is, you know, my, my wife and I were actually living in Asia. We were living in China at the time. Um, we're both, both American, but we had uh, lived in Asia for about five years. And I had a job that was taking me to city after city. I was on an airplane every single week. I was living out of hotels. My wife was pursuing her PhD. We had this bi-country marriage where we're seeing each other every couple of weeks. I mean, it was just like exhausting. And I reached this point where I said, enough is enough. I want to do something different. And so when we're looking at all these possibilities of businesses that we could start, we looked at everything from setting up a restaurant to import export, to teaching people Chinese, to setting up a cupcake shop, mm -hmm. to manufacturing jewelry, to all these different possibilities. And I started pursuing this idea of selling education. And so first business that we ever started, my wife came across this, this trend that was just taking over, that was exploding online 
on this website, Etsy.com, mm-hmm. which is eBay for handmade goods. And this trend that she saw was um, uh, Scrabble tile jewelry. Mm-hmm. So basically making jewelry with the Scrabble tiles from the game, origami paper that you'd affix to the little tiles, apply a resin on top of it, and it looked like this, almost like a, like this, it looked like high-end jewelry, but it was just made with this really simple ingredients. And so this, this jewelry was taking off like crazy. My wife approached me in my, you know, one of those dinner conversations that I mentioned where she was saying, we gotta, you know, just pick a business. <laughs> um, and, um, and she said, well, what about this? She said, look at this jewelry, it's selling like crazy. And I said, well, honey, I don't wanna tie ourselves. Her idea was we could sell this jewelry, we could manufacture this jewelry in China. We could, uh, we had access to inexpensive labor, access to all this mm. origami paper being in Asia, and we can import it into the United States. What about that? And I said, I don't want to tie us to a, a, a factory in China. I want us to be able to travel. I want us to be able to you know, make our own hours and have flexibility. And, and I was scared with the startup costs, right, of, of everything involved with that. Mm. So um, I dismissed the idea. A few weeks later, she, you, you know, in one of our dinner conversations together, she said, well, um, what about that Scrabble tile jewelry thing? And I said, I thought we closed the door on that idea. And she said, no, no, I want to show you something else. I want to show you this, this other thing. Uh, there was this woman on Etsy.com who wasn't selling the jewelry, but she was teaching people how to make the jewelry. Uh. And the cool thing about Etsy is that, and you can, I think it's still true to this day, is you can go to Etsy on anybody's shop and you can see exactly what their sales history is. So in other words, you can see how much money They made yesterday, the day before, the day before that. And so we found this woman. She was making uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 sales a day selling this $25 Mm. basically PDF tutorial teaching people how to make this jewelry. And so we looked, you know, her sales history the day before and the day before that. And we're we're reverse engineering. And we're saying, oh, my gosh, this woman is making like between $10,000 and $15,000 a month Mm. selling this $25 PDF. And it's digital. So <laughs> it's all profit. Like, this is incredible. Like, this is great. You know, so we bought her product and my wife looked at it and said, this isn't very good. There's spelling mistakes. The photographs were blurry. It was incomplete information. It was very much homemade. And she said, I think I can learn how to make this jewelry. And I think we can build a better mousetrap. Mm. So she learned how to make the jewelry, the process. And we documented it with you know photographs and step by step and all the nuances and all the questions that people run into. And we built a better mousetrap. We started selling it in our first month. We made about a thousand dollars a month, then two thousand a month, three thousand, four thousand a month. Eventually we're making like nine thousand dollars a month selling this little thing. We thought, gosh, we're gonna get rich. Like this is <laughs> this is incredible. We struck gold. Well, the story doesn't have quite the ending many people would expect. We mm. learned, and it's one of the lessons I share in the book, we learned that the Scrabble tile jewelry market was just a fad. It was like fidget spinners or beanie babies or uh, pogs or all these things that it was, it was the hottest thing for a moment, but we saw firsthand when the market became saturated. Everyone started selling the jewelry. Mm. Nobody was left to buy the jewelry. <laughs> when there's nobody left to buy the jewelry, nobody wanted to learn how to make the jewelry. So we saw that basically overnight our income go to nothing. Now at this point, I'd, I'd quit my job. My wife was finishing up her PhD program and we had this moment where we looked at each other and we said, now what? Mm. Right? No more income coming in. Um, we'd run through basically our savings and um, we, short story is we moved back to the US. She got a job as a museum curator making about $36,000 a year and we lived on that very mm. modest salary to launch our next business. Now, it's the story behind why I recommend the model that I recommend the book, which is selling education and expertise. I recommend this model for a few reasons. Number one, to sell information or education and expertise, the startup costs are incredibly low. Mm. I mean, you could literally do what we did, create a PDF, start selling it, and that's your startup cost. Mm. There's no manufacturing, there's no setting up a factory, there's no building a, uh, you know, spending half a million dollars to, to build a restaurant or <laughs> um, having a physical storefront with rent and all these things. You don't have any of that. So that's number one. Um, low startup cost. Number two, there's no inventory. So if you sell education expertise, especially digital, whether it's a membership site, a a digital course, um, if you do coaching, consulting, a mastermind, virtual summits, (laughs) which I know (laughs) is something that you've had success with, there's there's no inventory, right? Um, You don't have, um, if you're selling the jewelry, for example, you've got an entire, you know, warehouse or room in your house that's filled with all this jewelry, um, most of which Mm -hmm. isn't you know, selling. So there's no inventory. Uh, Number three, you're not tied to a physical location, right? So, you know, in your case, if you have a virtual summit, you could reach people around the world, Mm. right? If you are selling education expertise, you have access not just to your local market. And if your local economy is going great, awesome. 
But if your local economy takes a hit, all of a sudden, you know, people stop showing up to your storefront, mm-hmm. to your restaurant or whatever. So you have access to a global marketplace. And the thing that I'm most excited about, and, and you may not, you may or may not know this, this number, mm. but did you realize that over $450 million a day right now is spent on education online? I did not know that number. <laughs> I mean, when I look at the explosion in the education and expertise market, it is, it is taken over. And mm. I, I, this, I realized this the other day when I was looking at, uh, when I went to college, how much tuition was in, in, in for college. And I went to college, uh, I was in college 15, 20 years ago. And at 15 years ago, the tuition, room and board, the whole thing for the college that I went to was forty forty two thousand dollars $42,000 a year. That same college today, 15 years later. So not like, you know, 50 years later, just 15 years later is over $80,000 a year. Mm. $80,000 a year. Mm. That's insane. <laughs> and people are willing to spend that money. They're willing to invest. And the reason for that is just this global trend where people are investing in education and expertise. So I advocate for this model in a huge way. Now, whenever I bring it up, there are a few objections that people tend to raise. And one of them is, but what if I'm not an expert? (laughs) Like I don't have a PhD in orchid care or memory or whatever it may be. And, and to that, I'll share something that one of my mentors shared with me. It's always had a huge impact on me. Mm. And he taught me, he said, you know, Ryan, remember this for the rest of your life to the fourth grader, the fifth grader is a genius. (laughs) And I see it with my kids. Mm. I see it with my seven-year-old at home. I see him talk about, he's in a Montessori school. And so the kids are um, in, uh, it's seven, eight, nine-year-olds all in the same uh, classroom. Mm. And he comes back and he talks about his, his, his friend who's nine years old, right? Who, oh, he knows this. He knows, he knows everything about dinosaurs (laughs) and he knows, he knows everything about space. And I'm thinking to myself, if you only knew, right? (laughs) <laughs> but it underscores this important point, and that's this. You only need to be a few steps ahead of where your customers are in order to be able to serve them, right? Mm. You think about it, right? You mm. only need to be a few steps ahead. In fact, if you've ever asked any of your friends for advice or you've ever given advice and someone's taken that advice and said, Jeff, thank you so much yeah. for you've – sa- you've saved me so much heartache. And you're thinking to yourself, I just learned that like the other day. <laughs> but think about the transformation you've provided to that person. You don't have to be a PhD. And in many ways, being a PhD in a topic can actually be a hindrance Mm. because you have the curse of knowledge. You're so far removed from where that person is, where your customer is. When you're just a few steps ahead of where they are, the learning was fresh for you, right? Mm. The learning is still fresh. You just went through that process, that journey yourself. And so you're able to impact them in a way that in many ways can be more powerful than someone who's 50 steps ahead in that journey. So that's the first thing I'd say. Second thing is this, you don't have to be the expert. <laughs> People always ask me, how do you, how did you go into 23 different markets? How did you learn all this, you know, all these things? The answer is I didn't. Mm. There are ways to partner with people. There are ways to hire people. I'm not a world-class expert in orchids. Certainly I know <laughs> the difference between, you know, phalaenopsis orchids and paphiopetalums and oncidiums and dendrobiums. I know enough to get by but put me in a room with a bunch of true orchid experts. <laughs> I am not the expert. But what I've learned is that there are literally millions of people who would kill for the opportunity to get paid for that expertise. So mm. the person who uh, writes articles for our blog, she, she loves orchids. She had her own orchid blog. Her own orchid blog lives in New York City, likes writing about how uh, uh, orchids in small spaces. We loved her writing. We said, hey, how would you like to write for us? We just pay her. Chuck does our orchid videos. He's a retired school teacher who has a greenhouse at home and loves mm. orchids so much that this is like his thing. So you don't, if you don't want to be the expert, you don't have to be. Mm. And you don't have to have world-class expertise to be the expert in your business. So I, I believe in this model for so many reasons. The low startup costs, the high margins. You sell a $100 course, you make $100. You sell a $100 backpack, on Amazon, you might make five, ten dollars on that hundred dollar sale, right? I'd rather keep all one hundred dollars and have that mm. margin. So there's so many reasons I advocate for it. Um, it. Low startup costs. If you're bootstrapping your business, it's the one to get started with. If you have another business that sells something else, maybe you have a physical storefront. Maybe you've you've got something else. You can add this as a a way to augment your income. You've got a yoga studio, at, at, you know, where you teach yoga classes. Well, create a yoga course online. 
you you have a um, you sell a, a you have a, a a stationary store where you sell you know notebooks and pens and things like that. Teach a handwriting class. Mm. Right. And sell that online. You know, there's so many ways to augment your existing business with it. So I'm passionate about it. I believe in it. It's transformed my life. It's transformed my personal income. So um, I advocate for it heavily in the book. And whenever I talk to people who are trying to figure out what type of business should I start? Well, that passion definitely comes through. And I will always view you, Ryan, as the orchid expert because you can actually pronounce the names of the orchids, <laughs> which is more than I can do. <laughs> I know enough to get by. I know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to um, to be a world class expert. Well, in the time that we have left, I may have a question or two not related to the book. We'll see. Uh, but uh, before I get to that, anything else from the book you want to make sure we know? Uh, we didn't talk much about the five market must haves specifically. Yeah, I'll leave. You know, so I mentioned that there are um, you know these seven tests in the book, basically mm-hmm. to help you identify is the market you're thinking about pursuing is it um, is it a green light, is it a yellow light, or is it a red light? And so every test is designed to help you decide: should you take one step forward? Or do you need to take one step back? And so by the end of it, you've arrived at a market that is going to set you up for success. And so there's one of the things I talk about is the five market must-haves. I don't know that we'll have time to talk about all of them, but I'll share a couple of them. So one of the things I I, I discovered in this quest to study the successful businesses that we had started, the successful businesses that my clients started, and those that failed were these five market must-haves, things that every single one of the successful markets had, every single one of the failed markets was missing one of these ingredients. First ingredient is what we call going into an evergreen market. So I mentioned the the, uh, Scrabble tile jewelry business um, was a fad, it was a trend. It lasted Mm. for a season, but it wasn't something that had longevity. And so it inspired me to go into our next business in a market that would stand the test of time. Mm. And that's how I arrived at the orchid business, the orchid market. I started looking at, well, if this hobby of making Scrabble tile jewelry lasted five minutes, right? <laughs> what what are the what are the longest lasting hobbies in America? Mm. What are the hobbies that have been around like forever. And you want to know what the number one hobby in America is and has been for almost over a century? It's gardening, isn't it? It's gardening. <laughs> two hobbies that pop up, number one and two. It's reading and gardening. Awesome. And so when I looked at the garden, yeah, so, you, you know, so you're, you're in one of them, right? You know, so you're, it's great. Um, so when I looked at gardening, I said, well, gardening is so big, right? There's a, something like a, over 100 million Americans who consider hobbying, a, a gardening um, uh, their hobby. You know? So it's a huge market. Um, and it's way too big. So I started looking at what were the different niches and sub-niches within there. And I, I arrived at Orchid Care because truthfully, <laughs> when we lived in Asia, my wife and I, had a bunch of orchids in our apartment that we lived in and they all died. Mm, <laughs> so, oh no. That big long list of things of like, this might be something that people are struggling with, have challenges with. So I learned the importance of an evergreen market. And now an evergreen market, the way I, and I'll give you a, a few tips mm. to how to identify if your market is evergreen or not. You want to head on over to a free tool online. The tool is called Google Trends. Mm. Now, Google, since 2006, has been publishing the results of uh, how many people search for any given keyword on a, on a monthly basis. So you can look and see how many people are searching for, you know, orchid care or start a podcast or whatever. You can look at any keyword you want. And what Google Trends does is it gives you the ability to see that the trends over time. So, for example, if you take a, a, a keyword like, um, like one of the fads that I mentioned, like fidget spinners, head on over to Google Trends, look over the last five years and look at the, the, the search volume for fidget spinners. Mm. What you're going to find is that it's nothing, 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 nothing spikes to the moon (laughs) and then drops off the face of the earth. Mm. So if you went into the fidget spinner market, chances are you had a lot of success for a very short amount of time. Now do that same search for something like orchid care or uh, beekeeping or watercolor painting or newborn photography or these things that you'll find are these stable evergreen markets that just, I call them metronome markets Mm. because they just go click, (laughs) Click, click, year after year. That's what you're looking for. But here's the thing. An evergreen market is not enough. That's one critical ingredient, but it's not the only one. So you also want what's called an enthusiast market. Mm. Now, I learned this the hard way. So there are evergreen markets, markets that are going to be around for decades. They're around 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 100 years ago, and they're going to be around 100 years from now. Orchids, you can find paintings from the time of the Renaissance with people caring for their orchids. 
Orchids are not going away anytime, any soon, anytime soon. So that's 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 the first ingredient. Mm. But you also need to be in an enthusiast market because there are evergreen markets that are what I call problem solution markets. Problem solution markets are markets where um, someone comes in, they've got a problem, they solve it, and they never want to deal with it ever again. Classic example is like a flooded basement. You know, as long as there's water, as long as there's rain, <laughs> flooding is going to be a problem, right? Flooding has been around forever. It's evergreen. It's an evergreen <laughs> problem. But when someone has a flooded basement or they get flood damage, what happens? They call the company. Hey, can you remove and help us deal with this damage? They fix the damage and you never want to think about it ever again. Yeah. You're not signing up for an email newsletter. <laughs> on flooding tips. You're not signing up for a Facebook group. You're not signing up for a podcast that you're listening to mm. every single week on, you know, you know, flooding this. No, <laughs> you solve the problem and you move on. Now I learned this mistake when I went into the flea removal market, right? So if you got fleas in your carpet or your home or whatever, fleas have been around forever, right? But once you get rid of fleas, you never want to think about it ever again. So my little business, the flea doctor lasted for, you know, about five minutes because I learned this important lesson. Mm. You don't want to go into a business where you constantly have to get a new customer to generate a sale. Instead, what you want is a business where you generate a customer, you find a customer, and you can sell to that same customer in that same market over and over and over again. So a great example of an enthusiast market is like uh, uh, the dog market. So if you have a dog or you know someone who has a dog, then you know what happens, right? I know this because we just got a <laughs> little little dog or last year, right? We brought her home. What do we need? We need a crate. We need the, uh, you know, doggy bowls, doggy food. We've got to take her to the vet. We've got to get uh, doggy treats. Okay. She gets a little bit bigger. <laughs> we need doggy clothes. She's outgrown her harness. We got to get a bigger harness, bigger leash. You know, she, she wants more, you know, bigger dog. You've gone through the doggy toys, new yeah. doggy toys. We got to get the doggy Christmas ornament, of course, right? The doggy <laughs> mat. It just, Never ends, Jeff. It does not end. <laughs> what I realized is that for the next decade of my life, I'm going to be spending more money pound for pound on our four and a half pound a Chihuahua <laughs> rescue that was found on the side of the road mm. than anything. But it, it underscores the type of market you want to be looking for, a market where you are going to find someone who becomes a customer in that space for years and years and years and years. Mm. So you want an evergreen market. You want an enthusiast market. I'll give you one more. You also want to make sure that you are solving an urgent problem mm. in the context of that enthusiast market. What that means is this. It's not enough to go into the dog market and start selling doggy Christmas ornaments or doggy mugs, because here's the thing. Nobody wakes up in the middle of the night and says, honey, we've got to solve this problem tonight. We've got to get the doggy mug that has the doggy photo on it, and we got to do it right here, right now. What you're looking for <laughs> is a $10,000 problem. Not a problem that's that people will spend $10,000 to solve, but a problem that is is it is such a burning problem that people say, "Honey, we've got to solve this now. We can't put this off any further." So an example of that in the dog market would be potty training your puppy. If you've got a doggy that's at home that's peeing on the rug, peeing on the sofa, peeing on the bed, peeing on the clothes, peeing everywhere, <laughs> at some point it reaches this boiling point. You say, "You know what? Enough is enough. We've got to solve it right here right now." Earlier in this interview, I mentioned Dana Obelman and her mm. business, Sleep Sense, right? You right. can remember when you had young kiddos at home or, you know, if you've had any friends that have young kiddos, you remember what those days are like. Oh, yeah. It ain't fun when no one's getting sleep at night, <laughs> right? It right. reaches this point where it's like enough is enough. We've got to solve this now. That's what you're looking for is that urgent problem in the context of the enthusiast market. And the reason is when you can solve that problem for someone, when you can t teach someone how to potty train their puppy or get their infant to sleep through the night, you mm. become the trusted advisor for life in that area of a person's life. Mm. And they ask you, all right, my dog won't stop barking. What do I do? My dog won't stop pulling on the leash. What do I do next? My orchid you got the orchid for the the, the, the the flowers to come back on the orchid. The orchid's reblooming, but now I need to repot my orchid. What do I do next? You become the trusted advisor for life, and you can have a customer that buys from you over and over and over again in that evergreen enthusiast market. There are two more market must-haves. I know we don't have time to cover them. They're covered in detail in the book. And for anybody who's thinking about starting a business, the next step, the action item to take like right now is to just mentally think about your market your business, do they at least check off those three boxes? If the answer is yes, awesome. If the answer is mm, kind of, but not sorta, maybe the reason why you're having to work so hard to get the results that you're getting is because the market you're in, maybe you need to tweak, pivot. Sometimes all it takes is just a slight left or right in a slightly different direction that makes all the difference in the world. 
I so appreciate, Ryan, the passion uh, you bring to this. If you're thinking what I'm thinking right now, and, and that is that you would love to sit at the feet of Ryan and learn all day long, um, I, I do have some good news for you. Ryan is one of uh, 32 plus guests at the Boss Free Virtual Summit, and you can find out more about that right now at Boss Free Summit. Dot com. I will uh, finish by asking this, uh, Ryan. I know, uh, or at least I believe, you have a special offer uh, for the book you want to share. Yes, totally. I'm a huge fan of your podcast. Uh, I mentioned this to you, I think, off the air. When you graciously invited me onto your show when my first book came out, 2015, I thought it was, it was I, I think I can say it, it was my favorite interview that wow. I did on an incredibly long book tour, literally hundreds of interviews. And I just walked away and I said, you know, that interview was, I thought it was so, you were so well prepared. The questions were so insightful. Um, I think anybody who listens to your show is going to give me a, like a high five and thumbs up and say, just like you do such a good job. <laughs> and, and, um, and I was really grateful for that. So I wanted to give back and do something special today. And that's for any one of your listeners, I want to give them a free hardcover Hmm. copy of the book. I'll ship it anywhere in the world. All I ask is that um, they cover the postage, the shipping. And the book retails for $24.99 in the US, $33.99 in, um, in Canada. Um, the US, we're just asking for, I think it's $7.95 just to cover to get the book in your hands hmm. anywhere in the world. And on top of that, I want to do something super special and that's include over $200 in free bonuses. One of which is we're going to give anybody who takes advantage of this a uh, free copy of the audiobook. And the reason why is because I know a lot of your listeners are the type of people who just prefer to listen to things mm -hmm. like that's the preferred modality, whether it's listening in the car or working out or whatever. So I'm going to hook them up with a free copy of the audiobook. That's the first thing. Um, second thing is we've talked about all these markets. I talked about that there are seven tests mm. to go through in the book. And what I've identified is I have a list of the exact markets I would be going into right now. Mm. Markets that pass the seven tests. If I had the time, like if I wasn't doing this book and everything I'm doing right now, these are the exact markets I would go into. And so mm. I give uh, a resource that's the top 25 lucrative niche markets for 2019. Um, you get that. Um, we talked about mindset, right? We talked a mm -hmm. lot about that analysis, analysis, fear of failure. My academic background, like what I studied in college before going into business um, is neuroscience. I taught two years of a section of Neuro One at the Ivy League level at Brown. So I am obsessed with neuroscience, human psychology. And so what I uh, put together is 17 mental hacks that you can use to overcome all the head trash that... I know people struggle with when it comes to starting your business, fear of failure, analysis paralysis, overcoming self-doubt, overcoming you know self-confidence issues, all the things that we struggle with, hmm. 17 mental hacks. It's a course that you can go through and use these, uh, these tips and tricks in your life, in your business. Uh, it's a course we normally sell for hundreds of dollars. I'm including that for free. Plus you get access to all the digital bonuses in the books, the worksheets, the checklists, the examples, um, and wow. much, much more for free. All you get to do is just pay a few bucks shipping and handling, Ship the book to your house. Um, we have a special link, I think, that we set up mm -hmm. just for listeners of the show. Can I share the link? Absolutely. It's choosethebook.com forward slash lead. So L-E-A-D. Choosethebook.com forward slash lead. Use that link. You get all the bonuses, everything that I just mentioned, even some surprises along the way. Um, as well. So Jeff, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to share this with your amazing audience on your show and mm. um, to be back here for a second time. Well, gosh, thank you for all the kind things you said. And thank you especially for all those those gifts. Uh, I know listeners are going to just love that. The, the book, again, is called Choose, the Single Most Important Decision Before Starting Your Business. It is out now. Go to that link and grab it. His name is Ryan Levesque. Ryan, thank you so much. Jeff, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been an honor to be back and uh, looking forward to chatting again soon. Ryan is an extremely generous guy. It's not often that guests come on the show and then give their brand new book away. You can go to choosethebook.com slash lead. You can also go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash 265 for episode 265. Either way, I highly recommend the book. It's one of those books where the more of it you read, the more excited you become about the possibilities. I also hope you'll accept my invitation to join me and right now about 2,000 other people for the Boss Free Virtual Summit happening right now through May 7th, 2019 at bossfreesummit.com. It's free to register. And like I told my wife, it's like getting an MBA level education in being your own boss and doing your own thing in just eight days for free. 
I hope you'll check it out. BossFreeSummit.com. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Oh, 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 oh,